Greetings, Professor Chris Mason. We greet you today in our framework of our project, uh, Sketch of Separator. So, my first question. Are there any subcultures that threaten the European national security? It is, of course, a, a question that is very hard to answer uh, yes or no. First of all, it means uh, you have to ask yourself what it means to be a subculture. Um, uh, I have been studying the National Socialist Movement for, for many, many years. And during the 80s and the 90s and until the turn of the millennia, uh, we had a period that we refer to as the skin head period. Uh, that was a very subculture. Uh, a period of that moment. It was also a very violent uh, period. On the other hand, I wouldn't say that uh, uh, that subculture was uh, uh, jeopardizing national security. Surely they posed a threat in the local community where they were represented. Uh, they posed a threat to, to, uh, to, to their uh, enemies, mostly imagined uh, enemies. Uh, today, we, <clears throat> we do not have such a, a clearly uh, visible uh, subculture, but you have uh, other formations uh, that could pass as a subculture. You have remains of, of, of the skinhead uh, culture, but what you do have today uh, are, are ideas that were produced within this subculture milieus uh, some 30 years ago. Consp conspiracy theories uh, about the uh, replacement of white people, uh, about uh, uh, Jewish occupation of government, all these ideas that today are uh, penetrating into the mainstream uh, society, society. In this sense, uh, uh, the uh, legacy of that subculture is more threatening today uh, than the subculture movement uh, uh, was in itself uh, when, when it had its heydays. Please tell about your research into extremism. Extremism as a manifestation of a kind of a subculture. <clears throat> well, uh, first of all, it is a very tricky word, uh, extremism. Uh, what we mean by, by extremism. Uh, uh, today, it is almost always connected to, to, to another phrase, radicalization. Uh, and radicalization is the idea that people have radical, radical ideas and radical means. Uh, all of a sudden, we live in an era where radical ideas are almost always seen as something bad. <laughs> Uh, but radical ideas were the ideas that gave birth to democracy, that gave birth to, to, to uh, human rights. All, all those ideas were radical <laughs> at, at one uh, moment. Uh, so, so I am a bit uh, hesitant, not resistant, uh, but a bit uh, hesitant uh, uh, to, to the word uh, extremism. Uh, I prefer to talk about the National Socialist Movement or uh, uh, the fascist uh, ideology, uh, or the neo-Nazi movement, or the far-right discourse uh, that is uh, better situating uh, uh, these uh, uh, problems. Uh, but, but surely uh, we have extreme organization, extreme groups uh, uh, that are accepting extreme ideas and extreme means to achieve their goals uh, that are formed uh, as uh, uh, subcultures. Um, subculture uh, is a very, very, uh, when it's up and running, a very powerful uh, community that, that has a, a very good ability to both uh, keep a strict border to the mainstream society. It is very clear if it belongs to the subculture or if it does not. Uh, so if you're in the subculture, if you're not. Uh, but it also has this um, transnational uh, ability 
where subculture ideas, aesthetics, um, or, or a different sort of, of, of uh, uh, modus operandi uh, are uh, spreading uh, from different areas uh, in, in the world. And this is, I mean, this is what this, uh, subculture is very much about. You, you have the the hip hop, the rap music subculture uh, that looks very similar in in, in uh, different uh, countries. Uh, it is very clear when you come to a suburb in Sweden or a suburb in Ukraine or a suburb uh, in in, uh, in in the U.S. Uh, where you have the rap music subculture and where you do not have it. Uh, uh, but the subculture in these countries look very much the same. Also, when it then when it comes to violent uh, and and uh, uh, e extreme uh, subcultures, you you will see um, that they are using uh, the same aesthetics, the same symbols, same ideas, some same ways of uh, to express themselves. Uh, so so surely you 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 have extreme subcultures that are extreme to ideas and measures uh, that are interconnecting uh, and, and, and spreading uh, their, their, their ideas and, and their measures without being in contact with each other. So just, just as the, the rap musicians of New York do not have very much in common uh, on a personal level with the rap musicians in, in Kiev, uh, the neo-Nazis in, in Sweden, most of them do not have very much in common on a personal level with neo-Nazis in, in Ukraine, though we know that there have been Swedes fighting uh, in, 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 in the civil war in, in Ukraine, uh, neo-Nazis. Uh, but in most uh, general, they do not have any personal contacts, uh, but still they are inspiring each other. And this has not necessarily it's not depending on on internet internet is of course spreading this much uh, faster uh, but the subcultures have always been able to uphold this transnational uh, uh, spreading of of, of uh, ideas aesthetics and so on and so forth next question a few words about racism what preventive measures should be taken to prevent fatal consequences in europe for example all of a sudden, uh, we are in a situation uh, uh, where we are debating uh, whether multiculturalism has failed or not. And, and, and this is a really strange question uh, uh, to me. Uh, societies has always been multicultural in one way or, or the other. Uh, there is not such thing as, as a total homogenic uh, society. There will always be diverse groups within any community. Uh, so uh, what we had uh, in the Western world uh, after uh, the end of the Second World War until the end of the 1970s uh, was a unique situation where excluding nationalism <clears throat> was not longer a part uh, of the political struggle. Nationalism uh, has always been interwoven uh, with the enlightenment, uh, with the growth of the national state. Uh, it is unthinkable to have national state with, without having nationalism. So you have to ask yourself, is all forms of nationalism bad? Uh, and and for, for in the Western world, for, for, for about 40 years, 30, 40 years, uh, it was not needed to debate the meaning and the role of, of nationalism. Due to the Second World War, nationalism was seen as, uh, uh, as garbage from, from the history. But then it came back <clears throat> at the end of the 1970s, and it took about 30 years un until it uh, reached uh, the midst uh, of Western world uh, politics, and there are many reasons uh, uh, for this. But what we need to discuss today is if it is possible to have including nationalism, a, 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 a nationalism that uh, acknowledge uh, the, your identity to the country where you live in, 
and accepting other peoples to become a part of it? Or does nationalism always have to be excluding? Either you're there from the beginning or you will never be a part of it. Uh, uh, so, so this is uh, the big debate uh, that we will have, I presume, uh, uh, for the rest of, of my time on, 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 on Earth, actually. This is not the discussion uh, that is about to end. This is a discussion that is just about to begin. And, 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 uh, and, and we will have this discussion and hopefully, but I'm not so sure, but hopefully we will uh, uh, be able to have this uh, discussion uh, without increasing the level of oppression uh, or uh, jeopardizing peace. What is the social of threats today? You are actively engaged in research on uh, neo-Nazism. Uh, is it social movement or it's a subspecies of uh, subculture? To, to the last part of the question, I would say it's both. It is both. Uh, and it is not up to me to, 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 to say uh, to what proportion it is both, but definitely uh, uh, the, the National Socialist Movement uh, was transformed um, and during the 80s and the 90s, uh, during the, the skinhead uh, era. Uh, and it is unthinkable to think about the National Socialist Movement today without thinking about the skinhead era. When I interview leading neo-Nazis, they always talk about uh, how much, how, how repulsive they think about the skinhead era, though most of them used to be skinheads. <laughs> Uh, and, and they are not ashamed of it and they don't, do not try to, to hide it, but they don't want to go back to that clearly subculture skinhead uh, era. Uh, but the movement today uh, uh, is, is still depending on what happened uh, uh, back then. But when it comes to, 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 uh, uh, to, to, to social uh, threats in the society, uh, I, I would say that, that uh, there are uh, two very important social threats. One is, of course, uh, inequality. Uh, uh, we have huge gaps uh, between different continents, between different countries, between minorities and, and majorities in countries, between men and women. Uh, and these inequalities are, are growing. Uh, the gap uh, globally is closing. So the, the world today is a bit better or a lot better than it was 60 years ago on an average. Uh, but within uh, countries where people have everyday contact, uh, like in the Western world, in Europe, uh, we see the income gap uh, and, and the economical spending gap uh, is increasing. This is, uh, this is very worrying. Uh, the other uh, issue that we have uh, is, is the um, uh, hyper-individualized society uh, where so much uh, focus uh, is upon the individual. Uh, the individual choices, the individual liberty, the individual, and this is, of course, I mean, this is a result of enlightenment. This is a, a, the result of, of, of uh, the prosperous uh, liberal uh, democracy. But at the end, the absolutely independent individual will be lonely. And, and in the late modernity that we live in today, um, uh, the lonely uh, individual that is disconnected uh, from country, from peers, uh, fr from everything. For some of us, you, you know, this concept of anywheres and somewheres, some of us are anywheres. We can be anywhere in the, in the world, uh, travel, uh, cross borders, uh, giving lectures here, uh, settling there, enjoying the world, uh, true global travelers, anywheres. But most people are still somewheres. 
they are born somewhere and that somewhere is not in a country. It is a particular town or a particular neighborhood in a particular family with a social, social setting. And uh, uh, all this is, is crumbling uh, in uh, modernity, in the late modernity. So there is not to be uh, surprised uh, that we have a prosperous situ situation for conservative movements or movements that are uh, installing hope in collective ideas, no matter if it is political or religious movement offering this lonely individual a, a connection. Uh, so, 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 so for sure, um, the, the, the disconnected individual together with inequality are posing a social threat uh, to, 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 to our world. Uh, my question about your uh, last uh, work. Uh, what is a key concept of your recent research regarding violent extremism and the countermeasures to such actions? Uh, uh, currently, uh, I, I have been researching uh, for several years and still uh, ongoing uh, the patterns uh, uh, of uh, how to become a part of, of, a, of a violent national socialist movement, how you live your life in that movement, during what, which circumstances you leave that movement, and when you remain in it, uh, and, and how is it possible to leave uh, leave it and, and why do you remain? And um, uh, I, I will say that uh, as it seems, <clears throat> uh, my research points in that direction uh, that um, uh, what, what can be called as uh, soft measure confrontations uh, that are means that has been taken to prevent radicalization. So a soft measure, I mean, pedagogical work, social work, uh, when you install teachers or social worker, youth workers, to try to talk sense to, to young people who are about to enter the movement, these uh, practices seems to, to be counterproductive. Uh, a lot of the radicalization uh, happens uh, through confrontations. Uh, so, so, you know, when someone is, is trying to, to, to talk sense to you, uh, you, it is so easy that you will have the opposite reaction. And then when it comes to assisting people who want to leave, uh, then it is also the same thing uh, to, to, to have a non-judgmental uh, attitude offering uh, a connection uh, where you uh, can uh, uh, reflect upon your life, uh, uh, find new ways, new patterns without a confrontation seems to, to work uh, quite well. You see, uh, when we talk about disengagement, uh, most people disengage from these uh, movements sooner or later. Very few people remain there all their lives. So most people disengage. And the main reason for disengagement is loss of illusions. When they no longer believe uh, in the movement, not necessarily that they lose faith in, in ideology, but they lose faith in, in the capability of the organization uh, to reach its goal. Uh, when they lose faith in their peers, they don't believe that their peers in the movement uh, are able to, to, to go about and do what they are talking about. Or if they, uh, lose their illusions toward their peers because their peers are not such good comrades as they pretend to be. So in this period of disillusionment, 
they are stuck in the movement. Movement is everything they have, but they, they do not believe in it any longer. Uh, but the outside society do not accept to have a neo-Nazi sitting at their table. So therefore they are stuck in the movement until they by chance are giving a different opportunity. Uh, maybe they find a partner outside, maybe they reconnect with friends before uh, their time in the period, maybe they get a job opportunity and they seize that opportunity to leave the movement. So it is not like you leave the movement because you get a job. Uh, you are already in a situation where you have lost your illusions, you are offered a job and you take that as a way out. It is very important for youth workers, social workers, police officers, also school teachers to realize that these are the mechanisms. Uh, so you cannot ex uh, expect people who are leaving the movement to be without neo-Nazi sympathies. Most of them are ideologically radicalized when they disengage. They are still believing in neo-Nazi ideology, but they want out from the movement. So if they are, shall be able to get out of the movement, someone has to put up with listening to their neo-Nazi propaganda, their neo-Nazi conspiracy theories, until they de-radicalize and, and, and finally uh, are able to, to leave it uh, behind them. Uh, what subcultures um, movements maybe is the most powerful in Europe maybe? Well, it, it also then depends uh, when it, what you mean by, by powerful, but I would say uh, gym culture. Mm. Uh, bodybuilding. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, bodybuilding as we know it uh, uh, today, uh, how you train your body, how you portray your body. Uh, 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 it all started in California during the 1970s. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, you trained your body before that. Uh, even the old Greeks <laughs> trained their bodies. But, but, but how it is portrayed and understood today uh, uh, it started in the gyms of Cal in California uh, 50 years ago. Uh, fr from that uh, uh, gym subculture, uh, where it was immediately recognized if you were a part of the subculture or not. Uh, not only your muscles and your body that was obvious, but also how you got dressed, uh, how you got your suntan, uh, what sort of, of, of uh, brands on, on, on your clothing, so everything was very this clear subculture. Um, so so uh, that subculture was heavily attacked uh, by the mainstream society for many reasons. I mean, first of all, it was not necessarily accepted to uh, train your body to that extreme. Uh, secondly, and I think much more powerful at the time, uh, it, it was not accepted that men uh, were so interested in other men's bodies, uh, in men training their bodies together, comparing their bodies, feeling on each other's muscles and so on and so forth. Th this from, from a homophobic uh, point of view was not accepted. And then of course, uh, the steroids that they took and, and other substances was criticized. So it's a lot of pressures from, from the outside to this gym culture, but this gym culture, like all subculture, was uh, defending itself and it defended itself very successfully. So, okay, they admitted that uh, steroids is not a good thing, but it's a good thing to, to, to train your body, to, to, to pay attention to your health, what you eat and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and, and this gave birth to the fitness culture. Uh, and so the fitness culture is not a subculture, uh, but it is the offspring of, of, of the gym uh, subculture that has penetrated the mainstream society. So in the Western world, uh, we all, uh, whether we like it or not, are, are connected to the fitness culture to be able to, to answer questions. How do you keep yourself fit? Uh, to, to, uh, to reflect upon what you eat and, and, and how you portray your body. So, so, so this is a, a very, very <laughs> powerful subculture that has, has uh, 
uh, has, has changed uh, uh, a lot of, of, of how we see human body, how we uh, portray human body. In, in the same way, you could say that the, the, the skinhead cultures from the 80s and, and the 90s, they were able to convey their message, not their aesthetics, but their message uh, uh, from a, a very, very subculture position. Everybody knew what they believed in, what they stood up for. Uh, and uh, uh, all of a sudden, we are in a situation uh, where uh, most democratic parliaments all over the world are debating ideas that 30 years ago uh, was uh, the ideas of, of, of a very violent skinhead subculture.